Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad, and today we could also call this My Daughter Listens to This because it was Juliet's birthday recently, and we decided that not only would she get to pick the album, she would pick it from her own collection. Also, this is being recorded on Father's Day, and it's kind of appropriate because the band that we're going to talk about today has been described as Four Dads and Tom Petty. Juliet, take it away. All right, so if you haven't figured it out by Dad's description, we are doing my second favorite band of all time right after the Beatles, the Traveling Wilburys. All right, so for those of you who uh, maybe have never heard of this band before, uh, let me tell you uh, who the members are. So first we have George Harrison, a.k.a. Nelson Wilbury, because they made their own Wilbury names. George was, as everyone knows, the lead guitarist for the Beatles. When he went solo, his biggest hit was My Sweet Lord, and he's also the founder of Handmade Films in England. Then we have Bob Dylan, who is uh, Lucky Wilbury. He is one of the most influential songwriters of the 60s. His most famous song is probably Blown in the Wind. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in Literature, and he also received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama. Next, we have Tom Petty, or Charlie T. Woolbury Jr. He was the front man of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, who were together for, I believe, about 40 years. And his biggest hits are I Won't Back Down and Free Falling. And he's known for his iconic music videos, which, if you haven't watched some of his music videos, stop the episode right now and watch a couple of them, because they're fun, especially the one with Kim Basinger as a dead body. Well, the thing is, like, he's actually won the Video Vanguard Award. Yeah. So think of this. Him, Michael Jackson, Madonna. Who doesn't really fit in there? Uh, Michael Jackson. <laughs> molested kids. <laughs> no, I was thinking of more for the videos. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then we have Roy Orbison, Lefty Wilbury. Roy is a rock and roll legend. According to Paul McCartney, he's the only act the Beatles didn't want to follow. Um, Roy's most famous song is Pretty Woman. He did the Black and White Night concert with his biggest fan, Bruce Springsteen, as one of his musicians. And Roy has been described as having one of the most operatic voices in rock and roll. And last but not least, we have Jeff Lynne, Otis Wilbury. Uh, Jeff is the creative genius behind ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra, which that band was a pioneer of symphonic rock or orchestral rock. Their, their biggest hit was um, Mr. Blue Sky, and Jeff is also a producer of George Harrison, as well as the Traveling Wilburys. All right, Dad, you want to hear some history about this band? Take it away. Okay. So, the Traveling Wilburys was very much George Harrison's idea. Uh, he'd been tossing it around, uh, he'd been tossing around the idea of being part of another group during the recording sessions of his rock and roll comeback album, Cloud Nine. He discussed the idea with Jeff, who produced Cloud Nine, and Jeff was on board. A short while later, George went out to dinner with Jeff and Roy and mentioned that he was going to be making a single, asking them if they wanted to come and play. They both said yes, and George called up Bob, knowing that Bob had a studio at his house. Bob said they could come and record. Before they could record, though, George had to go pick up his guitar because he left it at Tom Petty's house. So he got his guitar, asked him if he wanted to join, and then they all went to Bob's together. They got to work, and the single Handle With Care was born. George and Jeff eventually realized that the single was so good that they needed to make an album. All the other guys agreed, and the rest is history. And George said that this was just a matter of everyone being in the right place in the right time. It couldn't have happened the way he did if he tried. So, no one knows how the band got its name, but the urban legend always was that the name came from the Cloud Nine sessions, that there were um, sound errors with the recording equipment, and George said to Jeff, we'll bury them in the mix. So Wilbury became a little inside joke referring to sound goofs in the studio. And the name was originally going to be the Trembling Wilburys, but Jeff had George change it to the Traveling Wilburys. Uh, however, though, in an interview with Jeff Lynn, he said that this story is a bunch of bunk and none of it's true. So, I don't know the real reason why they're uh, named the Traveling Wilburys. So, if anyone can tell me, though, please let me know. So the album was recorded over 10 days in May of 1988 because Bob was on a tight schedule because his tour, the Never Ending Tour, was coming up. So the album was recorded in Eurythmics member Dave Stewart's house. Uh, Tom used to say that the sessions would last late into the night and um, their kids would be complaining, Dad, I'm tired, I want to go home. And they'd be like, no! And then they'd prop the kid up in a corner in a chair and everyone would keep jamming with their guitars and ukuleles too in George's case. Um, the band was very much a partnership of equals, but George and Jeff took the lead as manager and producer. And the other musicians they had play on this album were Jim Keltner on drums, Jim Horn on saxophone, and Ray Cooper on percussion. And didn't Ray Cooper work with Elton John? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. 
Um, Jeff and George, once the uh, recording sessions were done, they flew back to England to get the album mixed and to negotiate with all of the members' record labels. And the record label that they had the hardest time negotiating with was Bob's label, Columbia. Um, the album was released in October of 1988 under the Traveling Wilburys label, with a fun little insert describing the fictional history of the band of the Wilburys brothers written by Monty Python's Michael Palin, because all five of them actually were Monty Python fans. Um, I can't imagine Bob being a Monty Python fan. I don't know, maybe when he was younger when they came out? I don't know. Um, or maybe it was a case of like where they all looked at Bob and were like, wait, you've never seen Monty Python? And they sat him down and watched the movies. Hey, well. this is pretty funny. <laughs> um, so Traveling Wilburys Volume 1 was a huge hit, but the band never had any top 40 hit singles. Uh, the album did revitalize Bob, Tom, and Roy's careers, though. The album went triple platinum in the U.S., which was incredible in a decade where hip-hop and pop were very much in and dominating the music business. Um, the album also won a Grammy in 1990 for Best Performance by a Rock Duo or Group. Uh, when Roy died in December of 1988, that was when the band began to decline. Creepily enough, when Roy died, George called Tom and said, Aren't you glad it's not you? Tom said, Yeah, I am. And then... They became the next two Wilburys to die, George in 2001 and Tom in 2017, with his whole death being butchered by the media. Wait, he's dead! Oh, no, he's not dead. No, wait, he, he's really dead! Ugh, I can't, I can't blame his daughter for being mad at Rolling Stone magazine. She was pissed. So, Traveling Wilburys Volume 3 was released in 1990, but it was nowhere near as successful as the first album had been. And, um... I guess George kind of let Bob take the lead in this one a little bit more. Um, the band also recorded a single called Nobody's Child as a part of Olivia Harrison's Romanian Angel Appeal to help orphans in Romania who were living in deplorable conditions due to the country's economic downturn towards the end of the Cold War. So after Volume 3, the Wilburys toyed around with the idea of a tour, but it never came to fruition. There was also supposed to be a movie about the fictional life of the Wilburys and how they got their start, but that got scrapped as well. However, the band is still fondly remembered as a rock and roll supergroup, which they are. Well, one thing was, after Roy had died, um, Tom had suggested that they get Del Shannon to replace him, but then Del Shannon committed suicide. So it just wound up being yeah. the four of them. I think they realized it wasn't going to work with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Dad. Now, do you remember when uh, the Traveling Wilburys uh, released this album when they uh, came out as a group? Oh, way back when I was your age. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. It was. It was. Um, it was an unexpected surprise. Mm -hmm. I mean, George had had his comeback, so this was just another step in that direction. And I was like, okay, yeah, it makes sense. And then to find out, you know, who we got to be on the record with them, that was, that was huge. Mm -hmm. All right, you ready to do this song by song? Okay. Okay, handle with care. Now, according to Judge George and Tom, George got the name of the song from a box in Bob Dylan's garage that had the words handle with care stamped on it. And Bob was saying, wait, you need a title, what's it called? And Tom said, and I saw George's eyes glance at the box and go, uh, it's called Handle with Care. Oh, great title. So you can easily understand why this song was a single first, because the way the song is structured makes it so catchy with the chorus and repetition. Repetition doesn't always work well, but in this case it does. My favorite part of the song in terms of the instruments is the sound they were able to get on Jim Keltner's drums with that da 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 boom It's a perfect rhythmic hook. You can also tell George is on the electric guitar because his playing has that distinct sound he makes with the slide. Um, the Wilburys' voices blend together even though they're all distinct. You have George's Liverpudlian, Tom's Southern Twang, Roy's Sumptuous Vibrato, Jeff's Light as a Feather Harmonies, and Bob's Pissed Off Bumblebee. <laughs> which is what he's always reminded me of. And you can come at me all you want, but you know it's true. His voice is whiny as anything. I think what I love most about Handle With Care is the music video that was released. Because you have all the Wilburys entering the studio, and all you see are these silhouettes against the sun carrying guitars. And you have the feeling something badass and magical is about to happen because they come in like gods. Then you have them playing with their guitars all together, and you realize these guys would love nothing more than to play guitar for the rest of their lives. And the ending of the music video is also very sweet, where the four of them, no Bob, Bob isn't in the end of the video for some reason, they're at the train station, and Roy's the only one sitting in a rocking chair, and he's looking like a happy grandpa, just rocking back and forth. Also, when um, Jeff sang Roy's parts of Handle With Care during concert for George, which for some reason Bob didn't show up, I still don't get why, um, Jeff is able to make these parabolic arcs with his voice that are a delight to listen to, like he keeps sailing up and up. 
Um, yeah, this is just an awesome song. Uh huh. Well, when I hear this song, I think George is singing about what it was like to be a Beatle, especially the lines about been stuck in airports, terrorized, mm-hmm. sent to meetings, hypnotized, overexposed, commercialized, and God knows all four of them were. And the thing about the terrorized one was all I can think about is the Philippines incident. Yes, oh my God, they almost died. Yep, yep. And then uh, Roy comes in with, I'm so tired of being lonely, which is perfect because who else is going to take those lines about loneliness? And I think it might be a nod to Only the Lonely, perhaps, which was a big hit for him. Oh, um, wow, I never thought about any of this. And yes, let's not forget about the gorgeous harmonizing of, oh. of Tom and Bob. God damn. Ah. At least Tom is trying. He's trying so hard and Bob's like, I'm just going to do what I want. And the thing that gets me, and this is something you you mentioned, was like when this came out, I always assumed it had been at least a top five hit, and it only made it to number 45. God damn it. And to quote Bart Simpson, I am shocked and appalled. appalled. But I think the thing is, like something you you had mentioned earlier about the type of music that was out at that time. I mean, this was just a basic rock and roll song, and it definitely was not what was going on in the the 80s. Definitely not new wavy, definitely not trendy. No. But... I'm still surprised that... Same here. And I feel like people can relate to the theme of the song. It's like, listen, I've been through the lot. If you're going to love me, go gentle, please. I'm feeling a little bit emotional. (laughs) Poor George. (sighs) All right. Dirty World. According to George, the part where the Wilburys list all the random things they love about this girl, you know, um, her five-speed gearbox and all that... Red yeah. bell peppers, that's my favorite. Oh, what's my favorite? I like Quest for Junk Food a lot, and I love it when Roy says Trembling Wilbury. Apparently when he said that, everyone just burst out laughing in the studio. Um, but George said that part was written because um, all the members of the band picked out some phrases in magazines that caught their interest, and so they just listed them off. Apparently one of them was going to be George saying, clothes that stretch. And he's, he cut that out because he said, even coming from me, that sounds too English. <laughs> <laughs> So, in all the times that I have listened to this song, I've never noticed that when Bob says, I can't wait to introduce you to my gang, all the other Wilburys come in one at a time with their haws, as if they're all jumping out of nowhere to say, hi! The part where Bob sings, you're such a tasty treat, makes me laugh the way he pronounces it. This song is another catchy one, but this time with the chords instead of the lyrics with the dun, 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 dun. It's a cute song about a guy who loves all the little things about his girl. Um, my one question, though, that I have no answer for is when the Wilburys are singing, you know, Dirty world, it's a dirty world, it's a dirty world. Are they censoring themselves and are saying the F word? Because I could hear the F and the I-N-G, but it seems like the middle is censored, so I don't know. Maybe that was Bob being bitter, but they didn't want his bitterness to show just yet. Well, I, the first time I heard this song, I thought, Bob Dylan takes a vacation from being Bob Dylan. Yeah. And God knows he needed one. <laughs> I mean, I never thought in a billion years I'd ever hear the phrase, sexy body, come out of the mouth of the voice of a generation. <laughs> never mind the words sexy and body. And hey, maybe he just wants to get some action, take a break. And I love that part, oh baby, you're such a tasty treat, but I'm on the doctor's orders, I'm, I'm afraid, afraid to, to overeat. <laughs> Ponder that one, Dylanologists. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if they even acknowledge this album as part of Bob Dylan's Canaan. Or if it's just like... Canaan, you mean? Canaan, Canaan, whatever. If it's it's just... No, that was just something that doesn't really count. And for me, this is like getting three songs in one. Like, first you get the four verses, Mm -hmm. and then you get the litany of he loves you this, he loves you that, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then Potty Mouth George comes in... With Dirty World, Dirty World, it's a dirty world. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's the same thing. I played that last part over and over to and see over. If you can hear it. And all I can hear is the ing part, no F bomb part, mm-hmm. and just silence on that syllable. And I guess that was intentional. I mean, I wonder if there's a version out there where you get the whole thing. Probably, maybe not, because at the time, the only other thing I can think of was this is when the PMRC was you know, really big about, hey, you know, we get to need, we need to get these albums labeled so the parents know where the dirty parts are. Oh, because of Al Gore's wife and the whole Nikki masturbating with a magazine. Darling Nikki, yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. So, um, you know, that sticker was never on the album, so maybe, you know, they figured, okay, we'll just do it ourselves and let people fill in the blank. Plus, I think another thing is, like, Jeff is kind of like a... Not a prude, but like very... He's a dad. 
I suppose, yeah, yeah. because when they wanted to, um, the filmmakers wanted to use uh, his song Living Thing for that movie Boogie Nights about the uh, porno industry. Oh, yeah, because it, it was like at the very end of the movie, you get to see Dirk Diggler's junk, and then it kicks into Living Thing. And at first, Jeff was like, oh, I don't know if I want this song in this movie. And then they show them the part, and he said, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Sure, you guys can you guys can use it. But yeah, he does have that impression of being like, like He's you more said, a dad. than George. Yeah, I suppose he is. I suppose he is. Yeah. Also, I think if there was an uncensored version, I think maybe Jeff Lynn is holding on to it because the album that I bought was the special edition where they had the two bonus tracks, which we're not going to review because they're not in the original album. But I think maybe if he wanted to do an uncensored version, he would have released it by now. Well, plus also there's like a, well, not really a box set, but they put out a version where you get volume one, volume three and a DVD. Mm-hmm. So it could possibly be on there. I'm not sure. I haven't dug that deep. The DVD is up on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Wilbur's documentary, if you want to find it, it's half an hour, but it's really good. Okay, rattled. Now, according to the mentioned Wilbur documentary on YouTube, the drumming was actually done inside the fridge in David, David Stewart's kitchen to give it that skiffle sound. He was just like, you could see Jim Keltner drumming on like these mayonnaise jars and like on the fridge shelves. And they did it to give it that skiffle sound. George and Jeff both said that this song could have been a rock song that was released in the 50s, and you can see why. With Jeff's vocalizations, the sound quality of the instruments, and the lyrics such as, I get rattled, I get turned upside down, and I get torn up by the roots, making this song sound like something Elvis would have done in his early days. Roy's trilling tongue is also a cool throwback to Pretty Woman, and whenever he does that, I don't know whether to find it disturbing or impressive, so I'll just say it's Roy being Roy. The bass sounds really killer in this song as well when it gets that little solo. Just adding another layer to bob your head to. And this is easily a song you can see teens in the 50s dancing to at a school dance or at a diner with a jukebox. Oh, yeah. This is my favorite song on the album. Really? And it does sound like it came right out of the 50s. And Roy's Tiger Growl makes it even better because it reminds me of something he would have done when he was on the Sun label back in the 50s. Oh, yeah? Sounds great. It's catchy. It rocks and rolls. And why was this not a hit? Again, because it came out in the 80s, and this was like definitely yeah. not an 80s type song. In the 50s, though, this would have been all over the radio. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, I like, uh, I think Jeff does a really good job. I like how simple the uh, the lyrics are. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, it could have, even lyric-wise, it could have come straight out of the 50s easily. Yeah. And... It's my favorite song on this album because I just like that type of rock and roll. I don't think first-generation rock and roll has ever been topped or ever will be. Like mm. stuff like Chuck Berry, Little Richard, mm. Jerry Lee Lewis. I just love that stuff. Even John Lennon said it. He's like, don't give me that rock and roll bullshit. Give me Chuck Berry. Yep. Yep. All right. Last... Right again, John. Right again. <laughs> last night. Okay, so in the grocery store that shall remain nameless where Dad and I work, this song plays... All the time. You'd think I'd get sick of it, but no, it's the Wilburys, so I don't get sick of it. And frankly, it's quite nice to have a song to sing along to at work to make the day go by. This song is the ultimate nightmare scenario for anyone that's hooked up with someone they met in a bar. I remember reading the lyrics for the first time and thinking, whoa, that took a turn. The opening percussion hooks you in and makes the song instantly recognizable when you hear it playing somewhere. Kind of sounds like a snake rattling or something. The cowbell is also a nice touch, and no, we do not need more of it. I love how Roy gets to sing the more intense parts of the song, be they sexual or murderous, because his voice conveys the high stakes of both moments. Also, when the guys go who in the background whenever Roy's singing, the context of the lyrics makes them sound different. The first time it's like, oh yeah, baby, we're getting it on and it is good, to whoa, holy shit, take my money, I don't want to die. And Tom ending the song with she went a little too far is the understatement of the century. I like how easily he seems to have moved on from it given how calm he is, and now it's just a crazy story he sings at the bar to make money. Well, yeah, the, the, fir- the first time I ever heard this song was at my job. Yep. And again, I heard it a lot. You hear it all the time. But I never got tired of it, but to me, th- this song's okay. I mean, I yeah. don't hate it, but it's, it's all right. And But the thing I, I, I've got a question about, and maybe you can help me with this, a few yeah. questions. Are Tom and Roy supposed to be the same guy? Is Roy supposed to be Tom's inner voice, or is Roy Tom's secret nighttime identity? Because the stuff Ooh. Roy sings happens all at night and it seems like tom's singing about like the day after what happened 
Uh, well, I think it's just like when you need somebody to sing about those intense emotions like fear and sexual longing, you're not going to have Tom sing that. No offense to Tom, but his voice is too light for that. So it makes sense that they switch to Roy because, again, his voice can convey that vocal intensity. So if we're going to go with one of your theories, I'd say that that maybe is um, part of Tom's conscience or his inner monologue. So it's not like late at night Tom's putting on his Roy Orbison costume. No, it's not Jekyll and Hyde sort of thing. Oh, okay. No. Any other thoughts on the song, or? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. But yeah, it it does kind of remind me of my job, though, because yeah. that's why I've heard it the most. All right, not alone anymore. This is Roy's moment to shine, and every time I hear him sing, I am never let down. I'm kind of glad he didn't go into opera or any form of classical singing, because his voice is just more extraordinary on a rock album. This song is the saddest on the album because what it's about just sucks. You left this girl for a stupid reason, you work on becoming a better person, come back in their life ready to love her again, and now you find her with another dude. That's just harsh. It reminds me of the scene in this movie I used to watch as a kid called Polly, where uh, the character, the janitor Misha, talks about how the one woman he loved married his best friend because Misha was too shy to tell her how he felt, and she said to him at her wedding, Misha, I always like you best. Ugh, that just stings, man. And then this song, Roy's vibrato, sounds like he's about to burst into tears. I can also see why Jeff Lynne was constantly in awe of the guy and didn't want to edit this song at all because he didn't want to mess with the voice. I also find myself not wanting to sing with Roy because he's already singing pretty damn perfect, so I just join in with the melancholy harmonies. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a classic Roy song. And the way that this is played and, and produced, it's like a pastiche of Roy's monumental work that he did for um, Monument Records. And especially when he hits the high notes at the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, this could have come out... This could have come out easily in that in that period of of uh, only the lonely and running scared i mean it's it, it's a classic roy song mm. i feel like also it's like i feel like maybe you know how um james brown sang with pavarotti yeah i think it would have made more sense if roy sang with pavarotti that would have been interesting yeah probably yeah. and i think with jeff producing I, I i know he was in awe of roy and i think he oh, just wanted funny. to get everything right on this song and he does he definitely does yeah like at the end in the documentary when roy's done singing this he went that's fantastic like no other critiques like you could tell he just didn't want to say anything okay dad you ready congratulations this song is bob at his most bitter and i am here for it this song is bursting with vitriol and sarcasm and who the hell else is gonna sing it i prefer i'm gonna say this now i prefer bob's later songs to his earlier works because his nasal whiny voice suits bitter and angry songs more than it suits the songs of the activist waiting for world peace this song is also really fun to sing to with your own Bob Dylan impression because you cannot help but laugh at the contempt this guy has for the chick who left him. And the bitter nasal, nasal sound, ugh, it's just the delicious icing on an already decadent cake. <laughs> I also love how the final twisting of the knife is the Wilburys sounding like a choir at the end of the song to sound like a wedding. Like a wedding choir as if Bob is saying, we can't have that now either, thanks a lot, bitch. <laughs> and my final note is, more bitter Bob, more bitter Bob. Oh man! Oh, this song is wonderful. I think on uh, on the site incorrectwillberries.tumblr, dot tumblr, this yep. this would be Tiny Bob's song to George when George announces he's marrying Olivia. Yep. I mean, Bob is just so pissed. He's furious. And <laughs> and again, Dylanologists, Dylan you need to ponder that one because the thing with the thing with um, incorrect <laughs> Willberries is. Is Which, if you haven't checked them out, check out their blog right now. Hi, Incorrect Wilburys, if you're listening, Wilbury Twist. They um, um, they they have the idea that uh, Bob and George are a couple because they seem to have written songs to each other back in the day. Mm -hmm. And also, um, do you want to tell them about um, what you read about meeting Bob Dylan in Beatles 66? I would, but I can't remember that. Okay, But so if you can, please do. What you told me Don't is get that old, kids. Um, the Beatles had been wanting to meet Bob for a very, very long time, and John Lennon idolized Bob, okay? So when they met each other, I think they met at Bob Dylan's house, or he came to one of their concerts, I don't remember how. It's like, John and Bob got along, but the thing is that the two of them were a little bit too similar, because they were polite, but they were always a bit suspicious of each other, oh, yeah, staying on yeah. their toes. And then, Bob met George, and the two of them just 
hit it off right away. And apparently John was jealous of George for having a better relationship with Bob until the day he died. Because he's like, God damn it, this was my hero. Like, he never said that out loud, but I think the thing was like, God damn it, this was my hero. I want to be best friends with him. But no, he had to be best friends with George. Well, maybe it was an opposites attract type of thing. If Bob and John had similar personalities, they would probably just always fight each other for domination. Yeah, but <laughs> Bob sees George and he's like, Hmm, easy prey. <laughs> <laughs> I <Which> love you. <laughs> I don't think George would have minded. He'd be like, oh, all right. Anyway, um, yeah, but Dad and I are fully sold in this theory that George and Bob had a thing, which segues into my, into the next song, Heading for the Light, which I have a theory about. All right, so Heading for the Light. I'm just going to say it now. I want to walk down the aisle to this song at my wedding. The lyrics, all the dreams are coming true as I think of you, would be perfect to walk down the aisle towards my future husband with. That's my favorite lyric in the whole song, actually, because it's a wonderful message. I can accomplish anything with you at my side. This whole song is such a beautiful message about how life was kicking you down, but then you meet that certain person and life got so much... Got, it definitely is if it didn't get better, you know that you can get through this. George's voice really shines here, and I don't know if most people would describe George's voice as beautiful, but my God, it is beautiful here because he's singing with such joy. He even sounds like his younger self. He's so happy. This whole song is one joyous celebration about meeting the one person that lights up your life. One thing, though, is that when George sings, I tumble through the roses and the thorns, the way he says thorns sounds so English, like he sings, when I tumble through the roses and the thorns. And it's like, oh, your Britishness is showing. Now the question, which goes into my theory, is who is this song about? The obvious answer is Olivia, because she was the love of George's life. But knowing George, it could also be about the joy of having found Krishna. Or, if we're going with our theory about congratulations, then maybe this song is an apology to Bob. Like, our love may be banned, and I might have to marry a woman to keep up the show, but you are my soulmate. And also, back to congratulations really quick. I'm surprised you didn't mention the lyric when Bob says, congratulations, you never did know when to stop. Maybe that's calling out George on his infidelity. Oh. Uh, ah. I don't know. Ah. But anyway, heading for the light. Well, Hidden for the Light, I mean, I didn't get out of that much out of it as you did because the first thing I thought was like, especially after reading the lyrics, was this has got to be another one of George's God songs because the man was a believer. Yeah. And the thing is, the false ending always gets me. Whoa. Always. I always forget about oh, it. Oh, yeah, me too. That starts up again and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, you get older, you forget stuff. But, um, yeah, catchy song. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, I, I I never looked at it the the way you did. I mean, I could definitely see that. Yeah. So I I'm assuming like when you know they play this that like I'll be walking you down the aisle. Yeah. Heading for the light. Yeah. Glaring at whoever the hell it is you're marrying. Yeah. Oh, take care of me, some bitch. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, Margarita. The first time I heard this song, I despised it. I used to refer to it as the turd in the punch bowl of an otherwise stellar album where it was awesome song after awesome song. Now, I still don't like it, but I don't hate it either. The opening techno notes are just too jarring for a rock album that was made a rock album on purpose and was supposed to be different from pop. The story of the song just goes nowhere, and I don't like the gibberish that was written in the lyrics. It's like if the final song in Greece, you know, with the we go together like ram a lam a lam a ding a ding dong it's like if that song was terrible. This isn't my favorite on the album, and it's easily skippable. The only thing that made me laugh was the thunk noise when Bob sings about falling over. It's like, eh. Maybe he really did fall over. Yeah. yeah, this is my least favorite song on here, too. The first time I heard it, I thought, nah, this doesn't fit, especially with the... Uh, electronic stuff which i thought well maybe since they were at dave stewart's house dave came in and said hey maybe you want to try this and they all looked and thought okay anything to get you out of here guy okay we'll do this but um yeah it just kind of rambles and wanders and it's like a minute plus before bob even starts the first verse yeah. and then as soon as he starts it kind of just seems to like end pretty quickly yeah, the song as a whole anywhere. yeah it doesn't really do anything but i guess to every album there must be filler Allegedly. Does there, though? I mean, maybe they wanted to get ten songs at least, but they could have cut this song completely and had nine perfect songs in a row. Yeah, that's true. Or maybe with the electronic thing it was, hey, it's the 80s, this is what the other bands are doing, We've gotta try and the people to, you know, the young folk, because this is the music that the young people seem to enjoy these days. A one and a two. <laughs> or maybe at least Jeff was like, hey, 
Let's try this once, and if we like it, it goes on the album. So maybe they just all lied. That could have been a, that could have been an incorrect little breeze. Hey guys, what do you think of this song? Oh, nice, Jeff. Let's stick it on the fridge with all your other ones. <laughs> like they did with Ringo on Family Guy. Okay, now now into my favorite song on the album, Tweeter and the Monkey Man. George said that this song was all Tom and Bob, and he had nothing to do with it because the song was so steeped in Americana that he didn't really understand what the song was about. This song really shows Bob's genius and innovation as a storyteller because, again, this song shows you can write a song about anything. I want to see this song staged or turned into a picture book for adults because the imagery is so rich. Like the, um, the uh, children's book Bruce Springsteen uh, published like a couple of years ago that was more for adults than kids. So with this song, you are sitting on the edge of your seat wondering who will win in the end. The monkey man or the undercover cop? My favorite lyrics are, Tweeter was a boy scout before she went to Vietnam and found out the hard way that nobody gives a damn because Bob is referencing a topic he wrote so eloquently about in the 60s and he's telling it all to real truth. Then there's, it was you to me who taught that in Jersey anything's legal as long as you don't get caught because this is such a cliche phrase that like everything's legal in Jersey that even Hamilton references it when there's a duel in New Jersey. But I like the rhyme of this song so it gets a pass from me. My favorite instrumental touch is the giant crash for it and the walls came down all the way to hell because it's such a resonant sound that it takes your breath away the first time you hear it. This is such a fun song to listen to, and I love the story of Tweeter and the Monkey Man. Well, I wonder if Bob is doing either a, a, a parody or a tribute to Bruce Springsteen because, yes! because he Mention. drops he drops a lot of Bruce song titles in here. Stolen Car, Mansion on the Hill. Thunder Road, State Trooper, Factory, The River. And he even throws in the Tom Waits song title that was popularized by Bruce, Jersey Girl. And at one time, Bruce was tagged or cursed as a next Dylan. That always happens when you've got like some mm. new, usually usually uh, a solo guy comes out with a guitar and a song to sing. He's tagged at, ooh, this could be the next Bob Dylan. Even Bob Dylan was tagged as the next Bob Dylan a few times. I think um, Jeff said that if, it, if there were any Springsteen references, it was Bob, you know, Bob, Bob, I guess the rumor was like Bob like Bruce Springsteen a lot too, so he wanted to like, you know, throw in some references just for the hell of it. Either that or maybe they were loving rivals. Either that or maybe he wanted to show him, you know, this is how it's done, son. Yeah. And I like it. It's a, it's a good story song, and it's worth the five and a half minutes of your time. Oh, hell yeah. All right, end of the line. Now, for me, this song is very bittersweet because it's the end of the album. But it's also bittersweet when you watch the music video and Roy's not there. Because Roy had died before they recorded the music video. So it's just his rocking chair rocking back and forth as his vibrato emanates from it like a ghost. So now I hear this song and I think of it as the Roy's dead song. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I know. It's so sad. It's like, it's all right. And I'm like, no, it's not. Roy's dead. It seems like the Wilburys are comforting us saying, look, when you go, you have nothing to worry about as long as you have lived a good and happy life. It's a nice touch that George takes the vocal reins on this one because the album was his idea, his voice opened it, and now his voice is going to close it. It's a nice sweet song to wrap it up that feels like some guy singing to you on a porch. Yeah, it's definitely a solid closer, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you've probably sung along to the Well, It's All Right part a lot. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, maybe I should have this song played at my funeral. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, uh, plenty of time to worry about that Yeah, sort of yeah, thing. yeah. But yeah, this is, a, this is a nice way to close the album, and I, I never, I never saw the video, and I never realized that that's what they had done. Yep. So it's it's a little more sad, but apparently when they were recording, they were they were kind of happy that day because they figured it could be a good tribute to Roy. Okay, so overall, this album is awesome. You have rock and roll legends coming together to release one album with one stellar song after another, and that kind of work could never ever happen again, no matter how much you tried to replicate it. Definitely listen to this album of Rock and Roll Giants. I listened to it once all the way through, and I knew I had to buy the physical copy of the CD on Amazon and not just stream it online. So, did you Did you find your copy, by the way? It's got to be around the house somewhere. No, I haven't. Oh, my God. Fans, if you find it, let us know. If you find my Wilbury CD, return it to me, and I'll shoot you an email with my address. All right. So, everybody, do the world a favor and listen to The Traveling Wilburys Volume 1. Okay, I've got a few observations before we close. Okay. And the first thing I noticed was that Jeff Lynne produced solo work for George, mm -hmm. Tom, mm -hmm. and Roy, mm -hmm. but not for Bob. And I wonder, would it have been too poppy for Bob? Probably. If put out a Jeff Lynne produced album? I mean, think about it. The guy is at ELO, which has its own sound, so... 
Okay, George being produced, that makes sense. They're very good friends. Roy being produced, yeah. Jeff Style could work well with that operatic voice. Tom, yeah. Tom was known to have fun. Bob... Bob is more stripped down and bare bones. I feel like he needs a producer who gets him and what he can do, if that makes sense. And also maybe just too British, considering Bob is like pretty... Bob is definitely an American performer, so maybe a British producer wouldn't have worked. No, I don't know. Maybe I think maybe it probably could just come down to Jeff's sound. I mean, uh, he's heavily, heavily influenced by the Beatles sound, especially... Uh, Sergeant Pepper Magical Mystery Tour. I mean, whatever he produces, you can hear that. I mean, even when they did that Beatles anthology, he produced it, didn't they he? had Jeff produce the um, uh, unreleased stuff, like yeah. that Free Like a Bird and, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe he, he would have had too heavy a touch on the Bob album. Yeah. But we'll never know until Bob tries it. Try it, Bob. Or until there's an incorrect Wilbury written about what could happen. That's true. Who knows? Maybe we'll write one. And so I have to say to Peg in Colorado, who asked if we do a Dylan, Dylan album, does this one count? Yeah, Peg, tell us if this counts as a Bob Dylan album or not. Okay, and Jules, I have a question for you. Okay. Do you acknowledge the existence of the Royalist Volume 3? And should you? I acknowledge the existence of it. Should I? I mean... Yeah, it's the second album that they did. Would I listen to it? I don't know, because, you know, Roy's gone. And I feel like, you know, when you have someone who's as big as Roy Orbison on that album, and suddenly he's not there anymore, that's going to be a gaping hole to fill. But if I ever heard it, like if somebody was playing it somewhere, I'd listen to it just to see, just, you know, because I'm a curious bird. So you think it's only a matter of lightning striking once? Yes, and it's very hard to strike twice. That's true, especially with Roy. Yeah. Okay, then. All right, on that note, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. If you're listening to this episode for the first time and you want to hear more, please subscribe to our channel. We try to upload videos every week. And if you want to know as soon as they come out, tap the bell for notifications if you want. If you like this video, um, you put the like, push the like button to let us know. And if there's something that uh, you like specifically that you want to tell us about or a fact that we didn't get... Um, then leave us a comment. And as always, we'll be back next week with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Once again, I'm the dad. I'm the daughter. Thank you and good night. Bye.